Okay, so let's do a little recap. I'm going to focus on the difference in the way the spiritual life plays versus what we expect it to be. The first difference, which is ironic because we do kind of expect it. The first difference is that there's a constant fight in your head. Now we do expect a fight. We do expect and even pride ourselves on a struggle. But we have no idea what kind of struggle that really is. We think that the struggle of the spiritual life is whether you're tempted to do drugs or sex or something like that. And we think that if you're doing good deeds and are moral and always talk nice and you're never mean to another Christian, that that is spirituality. Nothing could be further from the truth. Satan's basically fooled us. And this is how he does it. It's a classic divide and conquer technique where you take two things that are false, you set one up as being the bad guy, and you set the other false thing up as the good guy. So that way you can herd everybody over to the false version that you want them to be herded to. And those who won't go, well, you'll herd them over to the one you're calling the bad guy to make them look even worse. So that all those that you herded into the falsehood you wanted will feel better about the falsehood they believe in. That's classic. I mean, every single, I mean, you went to, if you went to West Point, you know, studying military in order to become an officer, etc. That's one of the things you learn. If you went to study propaganda, that's one of the things you learn. How to divert the enemy by presenting him with two falsehoods. And the one you want him to go to, you make it sound the more moral. And he'll go. Classic. That's how Mao took over, you know, communist China. That's how, you know, Lenin took over Russia. That's how Democrats win elections. Okay? In the United States. So, Christianity's idea of the struggle is really the struggle between two falsehoods. So it's lose-lose. The actual struggle is the struggle to not care about any of it. Not exactly not care, but ignore the entire world and all of its preoccupations. And there's a sort of an awareness on that too, which, you know, Christians routinely screw up. They think that if you abstain, you know, this has been a historical problem in Christianity. Oh, I'm going to go off into the wilderness. I'm going to go sit, you know, I'm going to go be a hermit. I'm going to go start up my own community, you know, whether it's the hermits of the first century because they set up their own community or, you know, the David Koresh thing or Jim Jones thing or the Mormons or you name it, little community. Geneva. That's all the same falsehood. Kind of surprising, huh? That's not... You don't... You don't remove yourself from the world. You don't win anything. Christ didn't do that. So why are you? So the struggle of being, as James puts it at the end of James 1, unspotted from the world. See, Calvin and a whole bunch of other people in history 
misread that as well. I have to separate myself from you. The Jews misread it constantly too. They never understood what God was doing with Israel. They never got it. Moses kept trying to tell them and they didn't listen. You are among the rest of the world. You're not like them, but you're among them. You don't hold yourself out to be better. What's better is the God you know, not you. And Israel had the rituals she did because they taught about this God. Not, oh, we're special, we're Jews, we're sons of Abraham. Ha ha, we're better than you. And you know what? Us Christians, we, we do the same garbage. We treat, we've got this holier than thou attitude. Oh, you should talk nice. You shouldn't drink and dance. You should separate yourself. Honey, you're more corrupt than the worst axe murderer on the planet. How is the unbeliever going to know that this God is actually real and better if you're treating him like that? You're a poor representative for Christ. And you know what? None of the believers that are named in the Bible as heroes are compatible with you. Paul used coarse language all the time. He uses swear words in the Bible. Oh my goodness. I guess he's not a good Christian. Christ called the Pharisees illegitimate. He called them bastards. He didn't use the word bastard, but it's the same meaning. I guess he's not a good Christian. He drank, and the Pharisees accused him of being a drunkard. I guess he's not a good Christian because he wasn't a teetotaler like Carry Nation. How can any Christian in his right mind think that, oh, you better never touch a drop of liquor or the devil's in you? I guess the devil was in Christ then because he turned water into wine. Unbelievable how people abuse the Bible. So yeah, there's a struggle all right. But it's not the kind the typical Christian thinks of. The struggle is, oy vey, all these stupid Christians. And they don't want to learn anything. They know everything, boy, oh boy. Doesn't matter how much the Bible or history or anything else contradicts what they say. And you got to live with that. Think about it. Look at how Christ talked in the Gospels if you want to know the kind of pressure it is and the kind of struggle it is. It's far harder than what any Christian on, in a pulpit can imagine. How many times did he leave the crowd to go up to pray? How many times did he reason with them? How many times did he say, How many times have I told you and you still don't get it? It's that kind of pressure. It's the pressure of you knowing, and they don't know, and they think they know, and there's not a thing you can do to help them know. So they're going to die in their sins. So they're going to die in their ignorance. And because you know and they don't, they know you know. Subliminally they know. Actually, God's probably witnessing. God's witnessing. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people tell me, Oh, you really know the Bible? Yeah, well, I know the Bible, but how do you know I know it? Yeah, well, because God, God told them. I don't want that. I don't want them looking at brain out. I want them looking at God. That's another command pressure you have. Christ was always talking about Father. He did not deny He was the Messiah. He admitted it and He even said He was God over 50 times in John 8, chapter 8 alone. And I did videos on that, showing it. First I thought it was only 26 times. Turns out it was over 50. I think it was 51. 
51 times he tells the Pharisees and all the crowd he's God in just that chapter alone. I didn't count the occurrences in other chapters. But his focus of conversation is not himself. It's Father. So the first problem that you have to live with, and this is a ruler's pressure, the first problem you have to live with is I know more than they do. And, and it hurts to do that. It hurts. See, this is the com- complete opposite of what Christians expect spirituality and good and everything else to be. Your typical Christian and anybody else on this planet would think that being superior is a pleasant thing, a goal to seek. That if you were better than other people, then you can hold your head high. You know, you strive to be better, to win, to beat somebody else. Oh, that's such a great thing. No, it's not. It hurts. You have to try and do your best because why else be alive? But not for the purposes of being better than somebody else. That's the bad news. That's the cost. That's the price. That's the ball and chain you live with. There's nothing enjoyable about being better than somebody else. Why do you think God comes down? He does not enjoy being better than you. He wants to give himself to you to equalize. Christ said to the Pharisees in John 10, 34, verse 34, just came to my mind, Ye are God's. He's quoting Psalm 82, 6. That's the plan of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 25-27 came to my mind. Holy Spirit's really insistent on this. Look up the verses, he'll tell you. That way you'll know that I'm not making it up. So you'll see his insistence too. God wants to pour himself into us. That's what this whole thing's about. Yeah, he's superior. He's God. What, what, he's going to stop being God tomorrow? Would that do any good? If it would do any good, he'd do it and he did the next closest thing. He added humanity to himself. And went to the cross. You can't go lower than that. And as a result, there is a cloning mechanism because Christ became the prototype soul, as my pastor liked to call it. And now his soul can be cloned into my soul. So I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm inferior. God doesn't want me worrying about it. He's training me to be a king, just like his son. Christ in you, the hope of glory, just threw that at me. Colossians 1, 25, 27, Ephesians 3, 15, 19, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, especially, filling all in all. The kitties of 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 of, of, of Isaiah fifty three ten realizing Isaiah fifty four one. He gave me more verses than that, but I can't talk that fast. You've heard me say them before. Corinthians, so First Corinthians two sixteen. I've got to throw that one in. We have the mind of Christ, the thinking of Christ. It's no the Noel is the verb to think. God's equalizing it. That's the part Satan just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't accept. God's God. We're us. We're inferior. Okay? But he doesn't like being superior. He wants to pour himself into us. Whole trinity indwell us. I mean, can you get lower than that? Hello. I keep saying to him, isn't this demeaning to you? He didn't think so. He wants this with all his heart and soul and mind. He enjoys it. Filling all in all. He just threw that at me. That's in Ephesians um, 1, 15 through 23, right at the end. Verse 23. He loves it. 
And I mean, no offense, and some people will take offense, but Paul picks up on this, and so do some of the other writers. It's intercourse. Now, I mean, if you're a guy, you understand that. I'm not a guy, and I don't remember what sex was like, so I really don't, can't remember how that works. It's been 30 years or something. I mean, I got a vague memory. Okay? The guy really likes feeling the girl. I mean, I, 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 I get that. But it's conceptual to me. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. This is where I'm deficient. But it's sex to God. It's like, this is why he invented sex. So you could get, the humans could get a sort of a sense of what it's like for God to insert himself in us. If you think that's offensive, I'm sorry. God invented sex too bad. This is what it means to him. So being superior to someone else is not pleasing. It's a fact. It's necessary for facilitating a group of people to work together synergistically. But it of itself is not a pleasure. When you're a parent of your kid, you are superior to them. No getting around that. But you don't put down your kid. You're busy putting up your kid. You're busy raising up your kid. Your kid is elevated above your own name in your mind. But he's actually inferior to you. And you're aware of that. But you don't despise your child because he's a child. You love him. So see, that's the opposite of what Christians expect the spiritual life to be. That, oh, I'm going to become this spiritual giant and I'll be better than Joe Blow Christian over there. I'm going to be a great Christian. No, you're not. And some people, they, they you know, pride themselves on their humility. Oh, I'm washing your feet. Yeah, and what you're doing in your soul is thinking how superior you are because you're so humble. So you are neither superior nor humble. It has nothing to do with that. See how different it is? So that's a really big contrast. You're not doing anything. You're learning something. Where all the little babies are out there doing stuff. Playing with their poo-poo. As a result of learning and not doing, you are doing the executive thing. The learning thing. Everybody who makes the big bucks, even in this life, gets it by learning how to think. The people who make the little bucks in life make the little bucks because that's all they do is do-do with their bodies. Now, some of them are really smart and that's the only kind of work they want to do. More power to you. Being a dishwasher sounds real good to me. Okay, I want to be the greeter at Walmart. Because a thinking job is very taxing. It's very tiresome. You're thinking for yourself and usually a whole bunch of other people. You're thinking through a design of a project. You're trying to make a, ca a car design, a computer design, a computer program. You've got to think out all the angles. And if you're ruling a country, you have to think about all the ramifications. And like I said you know, in the earlier increment, even breakfast is a policy decision. You have to think about 16 different kinds of breakfast. Okay, which version do I eat? Well, see, there's this policy decision. One has this set of vitamins and this set of calories, and it's going to do this to your body, and you have to take care of your body because you're not you anymore. You're a political entity. This is what royal, sh royal living is all about. You're not you. You don't have the luxury of being a simple human being. 
You're an entity. You're a polity. The President of the United States just can't get up in his shorts and walk out and stretch on the back lawn. Somebody will take a picture of him, and then somebody else will copy the shorts and make a whole industry out of what kind of shorts he wore. You just, you're not, you're not your own, like the Bible says. Well, that's really different. Somebody should have told you when you believed in Christ that you were in for all this. So, all those good deeds that people do with their bodies aren't the Christian life, that's Satan's life. That's what you do with your soul, that's a spiritual life. And you ain't doing much with your soul if you're not learning and living on Bible because that's the only thing God does. That's the only thing Christ did. Everybody says, what did Jesus do? But nobody knows what Jesus did because nobody's reading the Bible to find out. Whoops. Now, one of the big hurdles that everybody has, and I'm one of them, is that when you do examine what the spiritual life is, which is just sitting and learning this book and then taking what you learned in this book, using 1 John 1 9 like breathing, under that teacher that God assigned you, who you have to ask God who that is, nobody else can tell you. All you do is take this book and use it during your day inside your head. Doesn't matter if you ever tell anybody you're a Christian. You're going to be you're going to be stuck in that situation later in life. So there's nothing you need to seek to do. You do not go out seeking good deeds. You. God will direct them to you. God will appoint them to you. God will send the people to you. You wait on God to do it to you. You notice that pattern? Well, that's the opposite of Christianity. You just sit around and study this Bible all day. And you practice it on your email, and you practice it when you're cleaning the toilet, and you practice it when you're going out to a $500 dinner that you're buying. And you're going to have real fancy filet mignon and lobster. How can that be spiritual? And oh, some cabinet soignon. I forget what's a good year. I want to say 1980 something. I forgot all that stuff. Oh, that's spiritual? Oh, that can't be spiritual to have lobster and filet mignon and wine. All that money could have been given to the poor. Yeah, but it's not. How do you know it's not spiritual? How do you know what God's teaching the person he gives that to? See, it's what God does to your head using those circumstances that's the good deed. The God deed here. And if he wants to use lobster and filet mignon and cabinet sauvignon, which really doesn't go with lobster, but I like it. If that's what he wants to do, uh, honey, you got nothing you can say about it. God wants to baptize the meaning of that lobster and that filet mignon and that cabinet sauvignon. And maybe he wants to throw in a Ferrari too. And the person he's giving it to, well, he's going to teach him something with that. If God wants to do that, honey, you got no say in the matter. Now, that brings up, of course, the question. And Satan's bringing this up all the time. All your people are just sitting there studying and living on Bible. And you, and this is what he said about Job, and you just give them all this prosperity. Never mind that it varies. It's part of the training program. you got to have high and low. You give them all this prosperity. Of course they love you. 
and you're not doing anything for the world. That was the charge he levied at Christ in the three temptations. 